But I usually tell them it took me an entire year and, you know, I wore out my butt pads and things <laughs> like that. And people like literally in the ring, they didn't, you know, they, like they, they applauded, you know, when I did my first double axel because it was like, finally, <laughs> we don't have to watch this near-death experience again. From NCPR, welcome to Northwards. People, ideas, and conversations from and about northern New York, Vermont, and beyond. I'm Mitch Tyke. Support for the Northwards podcast comes from the J.C. Steiniger and M.E. McDonald Charitable Fund at Adirondack Foundation in support of the Adirondack Foundation building stronger Adirondack communities. My son has been skating since he was about three years old. Figure skating, that is. He picked it up because he'd go along to his older sister's skating practices when he was little, and it turned out that he was pretty good at it. So we were a little concerned when we moved here from Milwaukee a few years ago. While there are a lot of skaters in the North Country, there don't seem to be that many coaches to go around. Fortunately, he's ended up working with a couple of coaches that he likes and who are really good at helping him get better. And then, a few months ago, our local club announced another coach would be coming to help local skaters a few times a month for those who would like some extra support. His name is Paul Wiley, and if that rings a bell, it's because he was the Olympic silver medalist in 1992 and skated for a long while at figure skating's top level. It is not every small-town ice rink that has an Olympic medal winner working with skaters, but an increasing number of rinks in the North Country can claim that distinction, including Lake Placid, where Wiley and his family live. We caught up with him off ice in Potsdam. Paul Wiley, thanks for meeting me at 9.45 p.m. inside Pine Street Arena. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. I, um, I've really enjoyed getting to know this part of the world. Uh, I'd, never, I'd never been to any of these rinks before, and there's quite a lot of the skating universe that lives here, which is neat. Well, and I, I want to start there because, um, you know, when you introduce yourself and, and, you know, your title is Olympic silver medalist, 1992, there, there are a lot of people who, after doing what you have done, could easily call it a career or could coach a handful of students in a big metropolitan area. And here we are talking in Potsdam, and and you've done some work in Canton and in Norwood and maybe Messina and Ogdensburg, Ogdensburg, Lake um, Placid. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So, what is it that 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 makes you want to keep doing this? And at this kind of grassroots level, where you know you might have been fifty years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I really like to you know be a part of that process where you can see you know somebody hook into the idea of what it takes to jump and rotate or spin faster um, to have line on the ice to interpret music you know um, I don't know I mean I had people that were very helpful to me and I happen to have really good coaches and so I think that those fundamentals are such an important part of you know what it takes to move to the next level and unfortunately if you don't have them then it makes it very difficult to do the difficult things that you know people are getting credit for these days and you know it, the the computer changed everything right and so now you have to have these i mean we're, we're seeing quadruple axles and we're seeing you know quadruple combinations and and um, so the fundamentals of learning how to jump and spin uh, are even more important than they've ever been. But it's also important to remember that this is also an art, you know. So it's both a sport and an art put together. So though there is, you know, there are technical elements and grades of execution and, you know, all of that technical piece of it there is 50 percent relatively which is the components the program components the artistic mark and i think that a lot of times people forget that <laughs> <laughs> but it's what i fell in love with you know and it's the thing that i i love about skating is that it is that combination um that uh, you know trying to reach the audience with you know these difficult moves but choreographed into the program so that it makes it very exciting um, and engaging. Well, we're, we're having this uh, conversation and, and maybe some of our listeners can hear music in the background yeah. with uh, the ice show <laughs> practice that's going on right. uh, just through the wall behind you. Um, 
but uh, can you flash back to the 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 thing that made you fell in uh, the thing that made you fall in love with skating when you were three, four, five years old? Yeah, I mean, I I think um, you know. So I was in Texas. We grew up in Dallas, and the the only rink that we could skate in was the Fair Park Coliseum, and um, I had the Tonka trucks, and I'm like going around and. <laughs> My sisters both skated, and and they enabled me. My mom and dad enabled me to, you know, skate, and got me a pair of skates. And I think it was the sense of freedom and just this, it, the the very different feeling that you get when you're in um, in a rink on the ice. You're you're going fast. You're <laughs> stopping instantly. You're spinning. You're turning around. It's it's almost like you, you can do things there that you can't do anywhere else, right? And so, I don't know. There's, it's it's very exciting. And then then the music piece of it came later. Um, my first program that I competed with, and this is no lie, was dueling banjos. <laughs> Because, you know, when you're from Dallas, you have to, like, milk it. But, um, but you know what? I mean, I think that the music was such an important aspect of, you know, what I enjoyed about it was um, sort of taking something that, um, that registered artistically, emotively, and then, you know, putting it together with this af- athletic piece was really, that was a fit for me. You know, other sports weren't necessarily... Um, I don't have the best hand-eye coordination <laughs> in the world, <laughs> and, and I can say this because uh, because I, I am in the same boat. Neither of us is is a particularly tall man. No, no, <laughs> I am. Um, I, I wouldn't even say I'm of average height. <laughs> right. But um, you know, uh, you get gifts in different ways. You know, and um, I think that um, the, one of the one of the most thrilling things was uh, to be. You know, either in a competition or on the road with stars on ice, or um, you know, and you have a piece of music that you are sort of presenting for the first time, and it's a theme, or there's something about it that you know that is going to involve the audience, and it's exciting to to be able to have that expression. It's very, um, I don't know, it's part of being a human being. I think it's telling a story, right? Well, can you can you elaborate a little on the on the music piece of it because uh, you know I'm I, I'm a skating dad and yep. and uh, and you know you've worked with my son and yeah. uh, and I know every year there's there's a little bit of hand wringing that goes into figuring out what's the right music yes. that not only is a good demonstration for skating but also just feels right to him or or whoever. Mm-hmm. Um, how how did that process play out for you? Was there somebody that that flagged certain pieces of music, or were you always a music fan that that kept your eyes out for a particular kind of music? You know, it was a mixture because um, I can tell you that I I I used to buy you know way too much music at Tower <laughs> Records, and uh, you know when you had when it was actually records, when you could and then go to a record CDs store, right? And, yeah. <laughs> You know, and you just um, you you were boiling the ocean literally. I think today it's a lot easier in some ways. I would listen and listen and listen, and there would be certain pieces that I would get excited listening to, and I would bring them to my coach, and who was my choreographer, Mary Scott Bold, and and we would sit there usually in her car because I would I would <laughs> sort of boil it down to like four or five pieces. And I'll never forget bringing her um, Carl Orff's Carmina Burana, right? And obviously, everybody knows that piece of music, um, but nobody had really skated to it. And there was a reason for that, because it's scary, right? And It's not Carmen. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, it was in The Omen and things like that. But um, I, she, we were listening to it in her car, and she was wearing shorts, and I could see that she was that it was like the hair was standing up on her legs you know and so that was like i think we have a winner <laughs> because i you're looking for that kind of reaction right um from the audience something visceral and um you know oftentimes you go to the story that you're telling and then your program has dynamics right you can't you can't possibly just go 100 miles an hour the whole entire time you have to calm down and then you have to have something that's very, um, you know, big to come back. Um, so, I mean, I think that there is that pacing that's very important. And, um, 
Mary Scottfold, who was my choreographer for many years, just understood that. She got it instantly. And it was it was the gift that she gave me was knowing exactly where we were going with it. And then she would go and edit it with, you know, this professional editor and it would come out and you're you're thinking, Wow, I, I can't imagine having you know, I all I did was like listen to it and say, Yeah, I like this, but then she put it together and made it sing. In, you know, for a four minute program or a three and a half or two and a half minute program. Um, you know, I, I had an experience where I was very fortunate to, when I was, after the 88 Olympics, I went on tour with um, Champions on Ice afterwards. And I, I one, one of the evenings in between the performances, I was doing something with the Boston Symphony. And so I was there with Seiji Ozawa and John Williams and these people, and I was doing Peter and the Wolf. I got to narrate Peter and the Wolf. But during the rehearsal, I saw Tim Morrison, who is a fantastic trumpet player, do the JFK piece. Yeah. And um, and I was instantly, I, I, I got it. That was exactly what I wanted to do. And I brought it to Mary Scottfold, my you know coach and choreographer. And I said, I don't know how to mix this so that it's going to you know tell a story. But she then you know pulled so many different elements out of the soundtrack and then that became sort of the first of um you know a, a series of programs that i did that told that kind of a story mm. yeah well and that goes back to the storytelling you were telling and the, yeah. the idea that the the music that you skate to really needs to have an arc yeah exactly so you know you start off with something that draws the audience in that sort of explains who you are usually that enables you to do the triple flip uh, first and then the triple <laughs> axle second <laughs> right so there's a lot of tension that has to be resolved um and then you know you're you know then you're kind of off to what's next which is sort of fitting the rhythmic piece um you know or or you might be setting up something i, I skated through apollo 13 and um you know I, I was able to work with these fantastic lighting designers with stars on ice and people that you know were tony award-winning folks and um I'll never forget, like I had this, you know, at the very beginning of um, the Apollo 13, I had the jumps, but then there was this moment where I sort of skated around and around and around, and that was me taking off, right? And so the lighting designer made it look like the bottom of the rocket, you know, the, those kind of colors, the center of the rink lit up that way. And there was just something about it that maybe it made more sense to me, but I felt like it also made sense to the audience. And so anyway, those were the kinds of things that I loved, you know, that I um, that I got a chance to do later on with the shows. And I think skating shows are a really fun thing to do. I'm glad your son's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I mean, they're out there, they're yeah. out there practicing right yeah. now and they're they're not gonna work with a professional lighting designer. <laughs> they're gonna work with a couple of volunteers who are running Nor the spotlights. Nor did I, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Um, so what do you hope that you're able to impart, you know, aside from the, the fundamentals, but is there something, uh, some bigger picture that you're hoping to impart on, you know, kids that you're working with for 20 or 25 minutes at a time? Yeah, I mean, hopefully a love of skating that they can latch on to and develop, because I think if you can make it intrinsic, you know, that this, this thing becomes something that you really enjoy doing, and you can't explain why, then I think the sky's the limit. You know, these kids will, you know, can go pro. They can skate with Disney on ice. They could go, and you know, have a professional career. Um, you know, competing whatever it is. But I think you have to first be able to love it and enjoy it because it is hard work, and there there are demanding details. And learning how to jump and spin is hard, right? <laughs> and and you know, it's um, it, it has. A lot of the frustration elements of sports like golf or tennis where, you know, you're not always the same person when you show up to the <laughs> ring. But um, anyway, I think that if you love it, you'll keep coming back to it and you'll perfect it. And, and then the audience will love it, too. What do you think makes a good student? I mean, besides, you know, willingness to practice. I mean, that, that's, that's maybe obvious. But, you know... Uh, having briefly coached basketball and, and, you know, peewee baseball in my life. Um, 
with varying amounts of success. When you go out there and work with, you know, five or six or seven or eight or nine kids in an evening, um, what are the things that make certain people easier to work with? Yeah, I think part of it is um, this, you know, being, they, they first have to be able to pay attention and put the pieces together and they need to be curious enough to figure out, um, you know, okay, what is it, where, where are we in this, um, you know, in this process? And then, um, and then I think they have to be willing to go and try stuff that doesn't <laughs> feel right. You know, and I think that a lot of kids, you know, get, they get afraid of looking dumb or they, you know, think that it's too scary to do it because it just, it's a jump you know, or a spin and or they get dizzy and they do it one time and then they're done with it. Um, so I think, uh, you know, having been a skater myself, the most important thing to do is you learn how to get back up and try it again and, you know, push your own limits, you know, so that you can, you know, feel uncomfortable, feel off axis, feel dizzy, feel like things are, you're jumping too high or jumping out of the circle or whatever it is. And nevertheless, do whatever the coach tells you to do. And I mean, I think those are the those are the type of people that it's a very rare lesson. But you know, where somebody is able to take your instruction, then be curious about it enough, and then remember it, and then operationalize it. You know, there are things which take a lot of repetition in this sport, and I tend to do things the way my coaches did, which was we'll do exercises to get at the feeling of a jump or the tightness of the feet or the rotation of the arms or something. So they have to take that leap from there and, you know, put that into the jump so that they're feeling it in the air. You know, for kids these days, sometimes they don't want to, you know, they don't want to fall. They, they feel embarrassed when they fall. And so I try to be encouraging, you know, to say, listen, this is part of being a skater. This is every single one who's ever done a double axle has to fall and fall and fall, you know, in order to get there. And I was probably the most, you know, <laughs> I, I wish I could show them videos of me like crashing and burning. And, but I usually tell them it took me an entire year and, you know, I wore out my butt pads and things like that. And people like literally in the rink, they didn't, you know, they, like they, they applauded, you know, when I did my first double axle because it was like, finally, <laughs> we don't have to watch this near death experience again. So what do you think, what should a skater's relationship with falling be? So I think you have to always remember that if you're going to take a risk, that risk could pay off. And when it does pay off, it's really very valuable, right? And so, um, and it's, it's this discipline of trying to develop the muscle memory so that it does become automatic. And I think that that's the part what I try to instill to the student is, you know, what we're looking to do is develop a vocabulary that then you use effortlessly. And so, we, you know, if you've got your double jumps and we're working on your triple jumps so that you can pull them out at a moment's notice and, you know, do seven of them in a program and get a standing ovation, right? That's kind of what we're after. One of my colleagues is going to laugh when he hears me make this metaphor, but uh, it sounds like you're teaching them jazz. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I would love to learn how to play jazz. <laughs> I love jazz. Um, but in a way, I, I, there is improvisation to it, as I know there is in jazz. Um, and there is a, a sense that you have to have the confidence to throw it out there um, and be wrong, you know. Um, but that you get a certain, um, you know, you get certain things that you're able to do automatically and then those become you know your little riffs right and and that's that's when it gets really fun so so we mentioned my son out there yeah and I, I I don't know if you've noticed but I I suspect you have that he is the only boy on the ice yes. uh, most of the most nights As, in Potsdam yeah and then and that that is how we all grew up in you know and um and I think that there's I had two older sisters you know and sort of you know, I got dragged. I don't. I want to say dragged to the rink because, I, I said, I, I that's, begged. That's how he ended up yeah, at the rink. So right. <laughs> I begged to do it. I had my, um, you know, my Tonka trucks and everything. But um, yeah, it is. 
it, it you know you find yourself anomal like an anomaly somehow <laughs> <laughs> but um there's something um you know i i think what's what was really fun for me was the first time i went to a competition and i was nine years old and there were three other guys that were there and i was competing against them you know and it was like i just was like I wanted to play pinball, you know, and I just hang out with them. And then I was like, oh, okay, wait, we got to do figures and free skate and, you know, get this thing. Um, we're, we're, we got to, you know, vie for some medals here, you know. <laughs> but I think that um, that that is something that happens later on is that you wind up with camaraderie and, you know, you get a chance to meet up with and train with and perform with other guys and gals, you know. Um, and and they become your best friends you know and so that's that's pretty exciting but in general yeah you are a minority in this sport as a guy and in a rink it has its advantages sometimes. <laughs> right. yes as we were having this conversation right. uh charlie came in here and left with his girlfriend yes so. right yeah <laughs> so you know it is um it can be really it can be really fun it's a fun place to grow up would you have hoped at this point in your life though there would be more boys out there more guys skating yeah and i think what happens is um there are places where there are you know and um i i think that um if you go and there's a rink that has a, a you know a discipline like pairs or dance you know where you're you absolutely have to have that um and and i yeah i absolutely <laughs> would love to see you know a development of that and i think it ebbs and flows um, there are there are times when, um, you know, you, you see somebody like a Nathan Chen or Ilya Melanin or something like that, and those guys are, um, you know, they're inspiring, right? And so I would love to see more kids pick up the sport. Um, and if you go to a big city, I hate to say this, but if you go to Boston or L.A. or something like that, there are, you know, kids that, you know, are wanting to and, and lining up to try this out. You know, so anyway, when, when you go to a place like Potsdam yeah. uh, and, and you see the level of interest, I mean, there it's it amazed me when we moved here, how many skating clubs there are in the North Country yes. in towns the size of Potsdam and much smaller than Potsdam, yes. Norwood and and uh, and Lake Placid and uh, and others. Ogdensburg. It, and, Ogdensburg, which right. is a little bigger than Potsdam. Right. But um, do, do you take some inspiration from the the idea that skating is alive and well around the country in the way that it is? I, I love seeing it. You know, I love seeing the spring shows um, and, you know, seeing the kids get excited about um, being together, doing something um, and learning the, you know, the, the, here you guys do ice dancing, you do moves in the field, there's a precision team, you know, there's, I'm not precision, synchro, synchro yes, now, yes, right. sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we, we see, you know, you, you're seeing aspects of the sport um, in, in, a, in a pretty small universe, and I think that's neat. I think it's neat to see it. I think uh, I love seeing the grassroots, uh, and I'm I'm energized by trying to help. You know, to try to bring kids along, and to to see them develop correct technique and and a passion for the sport. And like I said, once you get somebody to love something intrinsically, then I think they're going to want to be ex they're excited to improve, and that can be, you know, that's the reward in itself. Really, for me to see that, you know, when somebody says, oh. You know, I did this today and I and I tried that that you and I, you know, extrapolated and then did this other thing. And then I and I think, wow, I really am able to, you know, kind of take stock in that and get excited about that. Stop me if this is too personal a question. Yeah. But you, you, you dropped the uh, the idea that that falling uh, back in your early days was a yeah. was a near death experience. <laughs> okay. You really had a near death experience right, on the ice at one point. Yeah, I wasn't on the ice. Actually. Oh, you were not on the ice. No, I was. Um, this one particular morning, I decided to go for the hardest run in Charlotte. You know, well, you know, it was it was a fast run. the the um, The workout was called Swift. And it was an hour long, and we, you know, I, they said I was doing great, you know, <laughs> and, which I like really. I, I'm like, okay, great. But at one point, you know, it was started at five fifteen, and uh, and and at six oh seven, I went down, and I was out for six minutes, and. 
um, you know, there were two guys, one guy that jumped right on top of me and, you know, started to do um, CPR and then a guy that took over from him and then they went and they scrambled and called 911 and they were there within the six minutes and they were able to, they, they, they used paddles and that didn't bring me back, but then they gave me sort of an injection and that did. Um, so it was a scare, you know, uh, it was a, almost 10 years now, actually. And uh, so um, I think it's a, it was a wake up call. <laughs> as I was going to ask whether it, it yeah. changed your relationship with, with sports, with skating, with, with the world around you. You know, I think, yeah, I mean, it definitely, it, it makes you pause. Um, it, it made me very grateful that I had um, the ability for somebody to, to revive me, you know. Um, and then I, I think that I have always taken my physical fitness seriously. But since then, I've, you know, I've been very I've doubled down. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to, you know, I try to eat healthily and all that. But um, it's, it's also about, um, you know, trying to find relaxation and rest when it's needed. Um, and that sometimes is something that I forget about. <laughs> <laughs> As we have this conversation right. at 10 past 10 <laughs> right. at night. Right. Uh, I just actually have one more question for yeah. you. Um, you know, uh, you, you can introduce yourself as a, as a Olympic silver medalist. What do you think people don't understand about the Olympic experience? Yeah, um, I, I think that's, it, it's it's one of those moments in your life that changes your life but it's kind of ephemeral right it, it goes it, 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 I, want, I don't want to say it goes away but the, there are reverberations that you feel um, but um, you know that was 30 plus years ago right and so um, it, it kind of fades in a way that is is strange because you spent you spend your every waking moment up until the time that, I mean, I was 27 when I won my medal. I mean, you spend your entire life devoted to this particular goal. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you move on, you know, and, and I think that's, that is, that is something very strange. <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know, because it, 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 on one hand, it is a career. It does sort of impact things for the rest of your life. But on the other hand, it, it sort of fades, you know, and so, um, and I think that that relationship of whether it's with you or fading, <laughs> it's it's that it, there's a strange there's a strange thing about that, and um, so, you know, you don't want to rest on your laurels, um, but at the same time, that was something that you accomplished, right? And I think that it's it's holding on to the tension between those two extremes, really. Well. Paul Wiley, thank you for helping us understand you, that. Mitch. And yeah. thank you for everything you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the hat. Paul Wiley won the silver medal in men's figure skating at the 1992 Winter Olympics in Alberville, France. These days, he's coaching skaters where he lives in Lake Placid and in other North Country towns and villages, including Ogdensburg, Messina, and Potsdam, where I spoke with him at the Pine Street Arena. We will do a double Lutz and then a hockey stop. And after we spray ice all over the microphone, I will turn things over to producer Ethan Shanty to close out the show. Northwards is an NCPR podcast production. The show is written, edited, and produced by Mitch Tyke with digital production supervision by me, Ethan Shanty. Caitlin Kelly handles our social media. Bill Hanel is our digital director. And Doyle Dean is our production manager. Music is by the Wickmore Jazz Trio of Plattsburgh. To support this show and find more podcasts, visit ncpr.org. This is NCPR, North Country Public Radio.